think we are recording now perfect so welcome to the second class on almaz folly and um, today we hope to begin and proceed at least one thirds into the text uh, first things first i did look for uh, academic editions but you know as i was saying it's difficult to find uh, too many academic or critical editions of almaz folly because it's not a widely taught text you know unlike heart of darkness or lord jim Uh, it doesn't have uh, a Norton critical edition or anything like that. But I was actually revisiting the Wordsworth Classics uh, double edition, the one that has the first and the last novel together. In fact, that's the one I'm going to use: Almer's Folly and the Rover. Uh, it's not a bad one. It has a decent introduction. It has uh, notes, uh, reasonably detailed notes of various complicated phrases and expressions, and. Uh, it's it's just the typical problem with words with classic texts that's there it's packed in and the the font size is not very helpful but otherwise you know it's not the most you know it's it's never the most pleasant reading experience but it's otherwise quite good so we might as well make do with that because we i'm not sure we have a, a better edition readily available at least for academic purposes uh, there are other editions of course but they they might be worse There's a Cambridge edition I saw of all of Conrad's novels, including Almer's Folly, but I'm not sure how available that will be, and that doesn't look like an academic edition either. Anyway, let's get started. So I'll pick up from uh, where we had left off around that idea of the voice, the novelistic voice, and we had, you know, a lot of discussion of this particular trope in Beckett as well, how the voice is severed from the body, how the voice is. wrenched away from the subject and it creates a kind of dislocation now interestingly uh, of course uh, you know compared to beckett conrad is more realistic even though in a you know psychological way uh, the voice is not entirely dislocated from the body or dislocated from the subject in uh, almer's folly but there is a tendency in the voice to hover around as i said the voice often blends with the atmospherics of the place pantai river borneo island and all of that so the very beginning of the novel if you notice is with the voice but this is a voice that is strongly and specifically located in a human subject so this is how the novel begins with a voice caspar macan the well known shrill voice startled almer from his dream of splendid future into the unpleasant realities of the present hour okay so the voice the well known shrill voice of mrs almer almer's uh, malayan wife um and this contrast between the dream of a splendid future and the unpleasant reality this is of course one of the central contrasts of the book we will see this throughout how there's a certain you know frustrated quest for not just riches but for a kind of good life in a foreign land and that's what this entire book is all about if you remember the discussions the brief uh, opening discussions we had about the the pathos of colonialism and the the pathos of the colonial master i'm guessing many of you would have read uh, shooting an elephant in your undergrads or maybe in your postgrads i'm not sure where that text is taught now if at all but anyway that that oral text is also specifically important for this right it shows the dependence of the the master on the slaves right uh, the master has to be sure about the image the kind of image you know the master is carrying we just do one thing yeah. Yeah. the master has to be sure about the kind of image he is uh, carrying and the kind of image uh, he has to maintain if he cannot maintain that image of authority that image of that that image of power you know all is lost so we see in a way again that hegelian moment when the master becomes dependent on the slave okay? uh to come back to uh, almer's folly you know this is essentially the pathos of the colonial master at a certain level that there are certain things that the colonial master is bound to do almost by default as it were now with uh, almer it's a little more complicated he's not classically speaking factually speaking a colonial master in that sense 
He's a businessman, a white businessman who finds himself in this foreign land, primarily, you know, with, uh, you know, his own dreams about finding a gold mine, uh, which is a bit of a colonial dream, of course, at one level. But he's not exactly a colonialist in the specific sense of the term. But in fact, uh, if you if you read this novel closely, what is interesting is that we have all these different kinds of colonialisms. There's, of course, Dutch colonialism here that we're talking about in and around the, you know, the Borneo Island. There's also the presence of the English, but the, the British uh, East India Company, so to speak, never quite arrives the way uh, Almer would want them to arrive because these are Almer's chances. Uh, if the, the island is properly colonized by the British, he would be in a much better position to realize his, you know, businessman's wishes or businessman's dreams. Uh, but that doesn't quite happen. Then there's this sort of complicated presence of the Chinese colonialists. So there's, there's Chinese, there's, uh, you know, British, a little bit at least, there's Dutch. And of course, there is the contemporary, you know, uh, rulers, the Malayan rulers, you know, people like Lingard and others, right? Uh, so it's very complicated the and, and complicated, as I said, in a conflictual cosmopolitan way, not in the sort of dictated peace of uh, or dictated harmony, I should say, of multiculturalism. Uh, anyway, let's let's come back and proceed with the, the beginning as we were doing uh, an unpleasant voice, too. So there's again this dwelling on the voice, the voice of uh, Mrs. Almer is unpleasant to Almer. And in fact, the voice wakes him up, as it were, from that dream of splendid future to the unpleasant realities of the present. Uh, he had heard it for many years, and with every year he liked it less. So what we can already see is that he's telescoping. It's a particular voice he heard at that moment, but he's already connecting it with the history of that voice. And it's very true for people we have heard for a long time, right? Be it a family member, be it a parent. When we hear their voice, it's not the first time we are hearing that voice, right? So we will automatically telescope that occurrence of the voice with the entire historical gamut, all the years through which, across which, I have heard that voice. And the voice is intensely dislikable to Almer, progressively dislikable, more and more dislikable each year. No matter, there would be an end to all this soon. Again, this is a fairly enigmatic sentence at this stage. What does this mean? Does it mean he'll die? Does it mean she will die? Does it mean he'll kill him, kill her? You know, these things are not very clear. What does it mean to say that, you know, the voice will come to an end very soon? But you see the concentration on the voice from the very beginning. Uh, and even though this is a voice specifically located in a human body, there is a telescoping and the voice goes back in time. And what we have is a certain historical, you know, occurrence of all the, you know, let's say iterations of the same voice, you know, all the many things that the wife has told the husband. Okay. Uh, and, you know, Almer sort of wakes up as it were, shuffles up and so on. Uh, and then we have the first reference to the river in the, in the very next paragraph. Uh, yes, of course, in the beginning of chapter one, leaning with both his elbows on the balustrade of the veranda, he went on looking fixedly at the great river that flowed, indifferent and hurried before his eyes. He liked to look at it about the time of sunset, perhaps because at that time, the sinking sun would spread a glowing gold tinge on the waters of the Pantai, and Albert's thoughts were often busy with gold. Gold he had failed to secure. Gold the others had secured, dishonestly, of course. Or gold he meant to secure, yet through his own honest exertions for himself and Nina. So you see how, you know, uh, Conrad manipulates color. In fact, if you see the film, uh, Shanta Lackerman's film, you would see how she uses color throughout. And there are these beautiful long lingering shots on the river where you know the camera just you know pans and sometimes it sort of you know has a trolley shot or whatever uh, so again the the thing about the great river 
is that it is both indifferent and hurried, which is a bit of a paradox if you think about it. When we say somebody is indifferent, we would like to believe they're casual, they're laid back, they're not interested. But this is someone who is indifferent as well as hurried. These two ideas don't always go very well together. But here it seems to you know, be the case. The river is both indifferent and rushed in a way. Right? It's indifferent to the human fate. It's indifferent to the you know, quest for gold. But we also see from the very beginning how Almer's thoughts are entirely fixated on the gold. So the water which creates this kind of golden, uh, sorry, the, the light that creates this kind of golden visage on the water reminds him of gold. And we also realize from the, from the very beginning here that, con, uh, that uh, he thinks of himself, Almer thinks of himself as an honest man. He wants to secure gold, but by honest means. And he's quite proud of that, the fact that, well, he has failed, but at least he has stuck to his honesty. You know, we, we will come back to this, but this again goes back to the point I was making yesterday that there's a self-reflexive heroism in Conrad's central characters or protagonists. They fantasize themselves as heroes. Do they always live up to that self-image? That's a question. Uh, again, towards the end of that same paragraph, we have the same kind of color symbolism, how the river and, you know, the light and gold, they all come together. There was no tinge of gold on it this evening, for it had been swollen by the rains and rolled an angry and muddy flood under his inattentive eyes, carrying small driftwood and big dead logs and whole uprooted trees with branches and foliage, amongst which the water swirled and roared angrily. So we see how the water, you know, has a life of its own. It's taking away all these, you know, jetsam and flotsam or you know, whatever you want to call them, the uprooted trees, the dead logs. And, you know, very soon, uh, Almer's gaze would again fix on one such object taken away in the flow of the river. Um, it also talks about, this paragraph talks about, you know, some. it gives us some details. Of course, this is the very beginning, right? So we are still, you know, you know the context is still, still being built up. Dane Marula is mentioned from the very beginning. He will return. Once he returns, Almer would go back to this 25 years of heartbreaking struggle, as he says, to find gold. Uh, the, towards the, in, in the beginning of the third paragraph, in fact, uh, or in the middle of the third paragraph, we have this image. Uh, the trees swung slowly round amid the hiss and foam of the water and soon getting free of the obstruction began to move down stream again, rolling slowly over, raising upwards a long denuded branch like a hand lifted in mute appeal to heaven against the river's brutal and unnecessary violence. Right? So you see the personification, right? The, the, the tree personified uh, in terms of a hand a hand uh, which is like a mute appeal, as it were. So we have this helplessness of the human condition up against the brutal and unnecessary violence of the, the river ecology, so to speak. Uh, Almer's interest in the fate of that tree increased rapidly. He leaned over to see if it would clear the low point below it did. Then he drew back, thinking that now its course was free down to the sea. And he envied the lot of that inanimate thing now, growing small and indistinct in the deepening darkness. As he lost sight of it altogether, he began to wonder how far out to sea it would drift. Would the current carry it north or south? South, probably, till it drifted in sight of Celebus, as far as Makassar, perhaps. So you see the kind of mapping that happens here. You know, we are given a bit of a map. But more importantly, what is interesting about this opening is it's intensely psychological, right? We are talking about how a human individual identifies with an inanimate object flowing down the river. He identifies with that object because he thinks of himself in a similar fate. And yet it's a complex emotion. It's not that he's simply identifying himself with the, the, you know, the helpless object being taken away by the river. There's an element of death drive here. He wants to be taken away by the river, as it were. He's, he's jealous of the fate of that tree, right? 
and and that's the part that is interesting you know he envied the lot of that inanimate thing now growing small and indistinct in the deepening darkness as if he would want to disappear like that so there's a there's already a little bit of a suicidal death drive here an envy about the disappearing tree that you know is taken away by the 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 brutal violence of the river on the other hand of course there's an identification with it because uh, metaphorically speaking almer knows he's taken down in that in that same way and towards the end the course of the river becomes you know quite uh, strongly like a map which gives us details of other places around like makassar celebus and so on um almer soon talks about his skills he knows english pretty well he's strong in arithmetic ready to conquer the world never doubting that he would again this you know desire to conquer the world is very typical right i mean it's a, it's a colonialist desire to conquer the world the word conquest is important here um makassar is soon established as i said there's a bit of a mapping that the you know the the river creates its own cartography as it were uh, makassar is soon uh, discussed as this place which is a commercial hub as it were and we are given you know some sort of a geopolitical detailing here what is this place because so far you know we kind of started entirely with almer's predicament and uh, the atmospherics and how there is a certain connection clearly between the ecology of the mind and the external ecology the ecology that is outside as i said we can already see how almer's own stream of consciousness is interacting with the stream of the river with the with the river stream as it were you know the characters are established one by one or at least mentioned the dutch mer merchants are mentioned the english peddlers are mentioned raja laut who is the king of the sea is mentioned tom lingard he whom the malays honest or uh, dishonest quite fi quite fishermen or desperate cutthroats recognized as a, as the raja laut so raja laut is the name they have given to tom lingard um and tom lingard is of course you know one of the most central characters across the trilogy though he doesn't have that much of an importance in this particular book it's mostly about almer um mr wink and some other characters are mentioned again i mean i'll just skip and go ahead a little bit um now this first chapter what we have is of course some sort of a back story about how almer came to marry this maler girl right and uh, you know this offer came from tom lingard and almer couldn't say no because he knows he has to do business right so there's a business angle here to this marriage as well he knows he has to do business in this place and he cannot dissatisfy the 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 local raja right so he has to marry and then you know uh, on page 11 this is again the third page or so from the beginning uh, you know there's this thought nobody will see the color of your wife's skin the dollars are too thick for that i tell you and mind you they will be thicker yet before you die there will be millions casper millions i say and all for her and for you if you do what you are told right so this is how lingard kind of you know convinces uh, casper almer into this marriage uh you know almer does have this inhibition from the very beginning about the cultural foreignness of you know his wife uh, whether as a white man he should marry another you know race so to speak so that that interracial marriage is important because the kind of complexities and mostly you know the kind of psychological complexities uh, we get out of that will be explored throughout the book in a way um we see a very deeply meditative gaze in in almer right again on page 14 it goes almer watched the canoe till it passed out of the line of light shortly after the murmur and again the voices shortly after the murmur of many voices reached him across the water he could see the torches being snatched out of the burning pile and rendering visible for a moment the gate in the stockade round which they crowded and so on but you know what we see is the the murmur of the water the the voice of the river you know that is also important the the water and the kind of sounds we have in the river they emerge as you know a separate voice of its own you know and a distinct voice of its own pantai was lost in complete darkness for the fire at the rajas had gone out together so again all these plays of you know light and dark 
and uh, you know, uh, Almer is quite an optimist, even though it may not always sound like that. All would be well, must be well. At this point in his meditation, he found himself at the foot of the steps leading to the veranda of his home. From the low point of the steps, uh, sorry, from the low point of land where he stood, he could see both branches of the river. So, and Almer gazing into the river, gazing into this hurried and you know indifferent river, is one of those tableaus that you know keeps coming back throughout uh, the book. Uh, the house is introduced in this first chapter as well, uh, in, in quite detail, what kind of house it is, and then the, the folly, of course, uh, you know, the, I'm not going to go into the details of the description, but the house is described in quite uh, detail. So, uh, and we are given some more specific details about his wife and uh, Nina, the daughter. Uh, and Nina is, is here, in fact. Uh, Nina stood by the table, I'm reading, one hand lightly resting on its edge, the other uh, hanging listlessly by her side, her face turned towards the outer darkness through which her dreamy eyes seemed to see some entrancing picture, wore a look of impatient expectancy. She was tall for a half caste. This expression is used uh, to refer to you know, her mixed uh, racial lineage. With the correct profile of the father, modified and strengthened by the squareness of the lower part of the face inherited from her maternal ancestors, the Sulu pirates. So, as I said, Lingard had rescued, uh, you know, the the woman who became Almer's wife from the Sulu pirates, and that's again something that adds to, you know, the discomforts of Almer. Not only did he marry a Malay girl, being a white man, he also married the daughter, uh, possibly licit daughter of pirates, of Sulu pirates. So there's, there's, there's all that, you know, complexity going in, in terms of the, the sociological dynamics of the marriage, as well as the racial dynamics. Um, Nina, as an embodiment of both her maternal and paternal lineage is something that we will see uh, more and more. But what I want to draw your attention to is again, this reference to her dreamy eyes seem to see some entrancing picture. So this is something that we see throughout this book. Most of these characters have a world of their own illusions that they've set up. You know, it's almost like a platonic world of ideas or a world of illusions they've set up. And the illusions are, of course, aspirational. You know, when you're in the middle of a rather sordid reality, you might want to be more aspirational than ever. And that's what we see in this book. You know, it's a, it's a novel of desires, so to speak, and aspirations to go beyond the, the sordidness of the uh, immediate reality. Um, the, the dreamy eyes of uh, the girl perhaps also, you know, you know, promise the first encounter she will have with Dane Marula, which would be like a love at first sight, as it were. Um, again, uh, the, the storm is mentioned, a tempest is mentioned, which is coming, and there's a sort of stillness in the river, a stillness and peace in the river, but it's like a dead calm before the storm. And the storm is mentioned, in fact, right at the end of this first chapter. Uh, let me read these few lines to finish this chapter. When the storm reached the low point dividing the river, the house shook in the wind, and the rain pattered loudly on the palm leaf roof, the thunder spoke in the prolonged roll, and the incessant lightning disclosed a turmoil of leaping waters, driving logs, and the big trees bending before a brutal and merciless force. So again, you see the agency in this ecology, right? I mean, the the agency of this ecology, the strength of this ecology. It's, it's I mean, it's it's quite a dark ecology to use that expression, which is used these days, in the sense that you know, at any time the human habitation might be ripped apart by nature. That's the sense we get, you know, the house which is standing on a rather wobbly foundation, the storm might, you know, you know, just, just destroy it at any point, right? So that's the impression we get, a sort of a destructive nature, as it were, uh, in this first chapter already. Chapter two begins with, again, some more detailing about this whole thing about Lingard, Nina, you know, uh, the, the, the wife from another race, 
Alme consented to wed the Malay girl. This is the beginning of the chap second chapter. No one knew that on the day when the interesting young convert had lost all her natural relations and found a white father, she had been fighting desperately like the rest of them uh, on board the prow and was only prevented from leaping overboard like the few other survivors by a severe wound in the leg. So another thing that is interesting here is that, so there's a local king, Lakamba, uh, who will come in later, and there's Dane Marula. These are all, you know, local uh, uh, you know, figures of, uh, let's say, royalty. Uh, Tom Lingard, however, even though he's called Raja Laut and all of that by the locals, he's not a local, of course. He's a white man, like Almer. So what is interesting is that Almer goes on to marry the woman who is not technically speaking, at least in terms of her, you know, racial color, you know, she's, she's not white, but at the same time, she does have a half white heritage because she's brought up by a white man, you know, and she's also converted to Christianity as we shall see very soon. So this is another kind of complexity. And the question remains whether this marriage of convenience would have happened had it not been, you know, the fact that she is brought up by a white man. So there's a whiteness in her. You know, what we what we have already in this book is an examination of not just interracial relations, but also what it means to be white, what it means to be black. You know, these are associations that are forming already in the second chapter. And these are questions readers would have. Why does he marry her? Is it because She's technically white, not in terms of skin color, but technically white. You know? um, so we have a reference to her conversion. You know, this is going back to the youth of Mrs. Almer. She bore it all, the restraint and the teaching and the new faith with calm submission, concealing her hate and contempt for all that new life. She learned the language very easily yet understood but little of the new faith the good sisters taught her, assimilating quickly only the superstitious elements of the religion. She called Lingard father gently and caressingly at each of his short and noisy visits under the clear impression that he was a great and dangerous power it was good to pro uh, uh, sorry, pro propitiate. Was he, na was he not now her master? And during those long four years she nourished to hope of finding favor in his eyes and ultimately becoming his wife, counselor, and guide. So it's interesting, right? I mean, uh, she thinks of Tom Lingard, who plays the role of her father, as a kind of master. She thinks she's she's perhaps a slave to him. And she might also, you know, go on to become a counselor, a guide, even his wife. But she, you know, happens to become the wife of Almer. Um, those dreams of the future were dispelled by the Raja Laut's fiat, which made Almer's fortune, as that young man fondly hoped and dressed in the hateful funerary of Europe, the center of an interested circle of Batavian society, the young convert stood before the altar with an unknown and sulky looking white man. Of course, sulky looking because he doesn't want to marry her. Um, but this is again part of the desire for conquest that Almer harbors within him. Um, again, we have that same uh, idea, uh, but the world had to be conquered first, and its conquest was not so easy as he thought. This is Almer, of course, he is Almer. He was very soon made to understand that he was not wanted in the corner of, corner of it, where old Lingard and his own weak will placed him in the midst of unscrupulous intrigues and of a fierce trade competition. So he didn't quite succeed, even though he became, you know, Lingard's, uh, uh, you know, family member, so to speak, by marrying his daughter. He didn't quite succeed in becoming a honcho in his business, at least, right? So that's what he had expected at some level, but that didn't happen. Uh, the marriage never really worked. Uh, there was no trust between the husband and the wife. There was, there was always, and this is very, you know, beautifully uh, recorded in the book especially with all these optical metaphors, how the, the gaze functions between the husband and the wife. The gaze often tells a story, right, about relationships. Uh, on page 23, it is mentioned 
uh, and this is Almer talking, she will poison me, thought the poor wretch, well aware of that easy and final manner of solving the social, political or family problems in Malay life. So again, what you see here is a cultural generalization, right? right? A cultural or an anthropological generalization where Conrad, uh, through maybe the character of Almer, is making a comment on the social practices of Malay life, as if the final solution to all the problems in Malay life is to, you know, uh, poison the husband, as if that keeps happening. You know, whether or not that is correct, uh, what we see here is again that anthropological commentary or the sociological commentary that uh, the novel does through the voice of Almer, as it were. Uh, of course, you all know this, uh, any realistic novel would have this uh, thing that is called the free indirect discourse. Free indirect discourse is a technique by which you inhabit several characters at different points in time. And that's the kind of narrative we have, right? The narrator is extra diegetic. The narrator is not a part of the diegetic world of the novels. In other words, the novel is not narrated by one of the characters. It's narrated by a third person omniscient narrator who steps out as it were. But this narrator has access to the thoughts of all the major characters. That is why it's called free indirect discourse. Free indirect discourse was the, the predominant modality by which the realistic novel functioned. But the more it accessed the automatic flows of thinking in the characters, the more it became psychological, right? Um, Nina gets a you know bit of a detailed characterization in this chapter. He could not take her back into the savage life to which he was condemned himself. So Nina, by the way, uh, got her education in Singapore and then eventually came back. Uh, you know, Almer was quite certain that he didn't want her to grow up entirely in Borneo. Uh, savage life, again, that, that, that expression could be underlined. He reckoned the years a grown woman, sorry, he was also a little afraid of her. What would she think of him? He reckoned the years a grown woman, a civilized woman, young and hopeful. So again, civilized and savage, that colonial, uh, you know, binary. Uh, while he felt old and hopeless and very much like those savages around him, he asked himself what was going to be her future. He could not answer that question yet, and he dared not face her, and yet he longed after her, right? So again, we see the intensity of the father-daughter relationship, especially from the father's end, albeit with a very strong sense of patronization. Um, so Almer behind her, beheld her, sorry, this is uh, you know when Nina comes back, uh, Almer beheld her with surprise, not unmixed with wonder. During those 10 years, so she comes back after 10 years, now she's a woman, uh, the child had changed into a woman, black haired, olive skinned, tall and beautiful, with great sad eyes, where the startled expression common to Malay womankind was modified by a thoughtful tinge inherited from her European ancestry. See the description, how he's, you know, uh, hybridizing and the hybridization happens because he's kind of stereotyping both. You know, the interesting thing is he, in that sentence I just read out, he wasn't only stereotyping Malay women. He was also, in a certain sense, stereotyping the Europeans, right? So as if there's that common startled expression that all Malay women have, and as if that tinge, that thoughtful tinge is something that, you know, all Europeans have. Of course, that's not true either. Uh, I mean, neither is true, right? But uh, let's mark this kind, these kinds of descriptions. And again, the kind of cultural stereotyping that happens. In the very next sentence, he goes on to say, you know, she is different in a way from her beetle nut chewing mother. Beetle nut chewing mother, again, a somewhat derogatory reference to the, the, you know, the, the Malay community and the Malay women there. The question of the voice, let's come back to that. You know, we will keep coming back to that throughout, of course. And he stood there before the closed door of the hut in the blazing sunshine, listening to the murmur of voices, wondering what went on inside, where from all the servant maids had been expelled at the beginning of the interview and now stood clustered by the palings with half covered faces in a chatter of curious speculation. So he's extremely attentive to sounds, voices, but these are not spooky voices. These are actually women 
standing there and chattering, you know, talking to each other, uh, the, the maids in the house. Um, right. So again, there's, there's a latent of a sexism in expressions like uh, Ford say little beyond generalizing in vague but violent terms upon the foolishness of women in general and Mrs. Wink in particular. So, you know, one of the things that we, I suppose, have to be a little bit careful about before we make any kind of accusations about any writer is that a novel is always a plurivocal form. There are multiple voices and, you know, multiple characters that have their own opinions, that have their own observations. Until and unless a novel, through its discursivity, explicitly supports an ideology, it's very difficult to say uh, in a global way that the entire novel is sexist. Like, for example, what I just read out in terms of, you know, the comment on the foolishness of women in general, this comes from this English, you know, colonial master, Ford, right? So it's an expected statement coming from him that doesn't necessarily make it an author-backed statement or a discursively backed statement. So let's keep that point in mind. The wife, Mrs. Almer, is uh, continuously, you know, likened to a witch. This happens again at the end of this chapter. His wife came out of her seclusion, importing her green jacket, scant sarongs, shrill voice and witch-like appearance into his quiet life in the small bungalow. We will see, you know, more of this association with the witch and how she would really sort of support the romance that, you know, brews between uh, Dane Marula and uh, Nina. The water, this is the beginning of chapter three, uh, drop of bitterness to the cup of his disenchantments. Tropics added another drop of bitterness to the cup of his disenchantments. See the water metaphor? So it's not just the, you know, the river as such, literally the river, everything around uh, seems to be, you know, floating in this sort of an aquatic language, as it were, or an aquatic metaphor. Um, and once again, he could not help comparing his own fleeting hopes to the rapidly disappearing vapor. This is Almer, of course. His own fleeting hopes are compared to the rapidly disappearing vapor. So once again, that water image. Uh, foolish hopefulness of the man. It's mentioned again. This is all in chapter three. Almer's lamentable narratives. This is constantly this, you know, emphasis on the frustrated hope that, you know, Almer has. Uh, he can't leave this life. He doesn't want this life either. He's, he's, you know, in that caught in that kind of double bind, as it were. Uh, there are characters like Bulangi and Babalachi, the two slaves. Uh, you know, the, there's more on that. We will come come back to these two characters later. They will have important plot functions at least. Again, the gold is mentioned here uh, more clearly. The coast population of Borneo believes implicitly in diamonds of fabulous value, in gold mines of enormous riches, richness in the interior, and all those imaginings are heightened by the difficulty of penetrating far inland, especially on the northeast coast and so on. So this is the, the whole you know, narrative of gold mines, as it were, which is again one such dreamy narrative, right? Aspirational narrative. Um, okay, so let's move on a little bit more quickly. Uh, Almer's folly is mentioned in this particular chapter, the third chapter. Uh, there are, you know, these moments, of course, of disagreement or, uh, again, that kind of creepy silence, as it were, between the husband and the wife. Uh, you know, moments like, for example, you know, Casper, I'm your wife, your own Christian wife, after your own blunder law. For she knew that this was the bitterest thing of all, the greatest regret of that man's life. So this is in the middle of a fight. The, the wife tells the husband and, you know, because she knows this is what he regrets the most, having her as a wife. You know? And soon after that, Almer's folly is mentioned and uh, Mrs. Almer's thoughts. So again, we have that sort of stream of consciousness element here. Uh, Mrs. Almer's thoughts after these scenes were usually turned into a channel of childhood reminiscences. And she gave them utterance in a kind of monotonous recitative 
slightly disconnected, but generally describing the glories of the Sultan of Sulu, his great splendor, his power, his great prowess, the fear that ben which benumbed the hearts of white men at the sight of his swift piratical prose and, and goes on like that. So this is again the free indirect discourse. Now it has inhabited the thoughts of Mrs. Almer. Uh, uh, of course, Mr. Mr. Almer. Almer. Is there something that you wanted to say? Otherwise, could you? Yeah, thank you. I mean, you've unmuted yourself because otherwise I was hearing an echo of my voice. That's the problem. So again, uh, the witch-like uh, being is mentioned. Uh, the mother, Nina's mother, is, is someone, again, likened to witches in this chapter. Uh, the, there's some sort of abyss, as it were, inside her, which is threatening and, 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 and terrifying. Um, unfortunately, her teachers did not understand her nature. This is uh, about Nina. So Nina uh, had to face a good deal of humiliation being a uh, half caste, again, quote unquote, in Singapore. Right. I mean, so again, I mean, this is a very typical diasporic insight about hybridized subjects who are between cultures, who are caught between cultures. You are neither considered, you know, Indian nor uh, British, let's say. This is very typical of many people uh, in the diaspora or, or you know, in, any, in any country, in fact. Um, Nina, again, I mean, all these details about Nina are important. Uh, so let me just uh, read a few things. Uh, you know, how she reflects on her mixed uh, lineage is what we're talking about. Her young mind having been unskillfully permitted to glance at better things and then thrown back again into the hopeless quagmire of barbarism, full of strong and uncontrolled passions, had lost the power to discriminate. So she saw, a, again, a quote-unquote better world in Singapore for 10 years, which was different, and then had to come back again. I mean, she didn't have too many choices of her own. Nina saw only the same manifestations of love and hate and of sordid greed chasing the uncertain dollar in all its multifarious and vanishing shapes. So this, you know, mercantilism or this greed for money, for power. To her resolute nature after all these years, the savage and uncompromising sincerity of purpose shown by her Malay kinsman seemed at last preferable to the sleek hypocrisy, to the polite disguises, to the virtuous pretenses of such white people as she had had the misfortune to come in contact with. So you can see where her, you know, her, her own identifications are. She's very clear on this. Rajas from whose race she had sprung and she became gradually more indifferent, more contemptuous of the white side of her descent, represented by a feeble and traditionless father. Feeble and traditionless father. So uh, she's more maternally identified that way, more identified with her male, uh, you know, background than the white uh, heritage or whatever, you know, lack of it, whatever she, she might have. Um, yeah, that's it in terms of this chapter. Let's just move on a little bit uh, and let's go a little bit faster as well, I'm aware of time. Um, so again, the hum of voices is mentioned in chapter four, the very beginning of chapter four. Uh, as I was saying, the, the unsuccessful nature of the Dutch expedition in this area uh, because of various conflicts with the local king, Lakamba, uh, and also, you know, the the unsuccessful nature of the British uh, colonialism around this place. This place is called Sambir, by the way. That's another uh, name for the place, uh, apart from uh, Borneo Island. Uh, okay, I'm just going to move on. Dane Marula comes in, in this chapter, and they meet for the first time, Dane and uh, Nina. Uh, and from the very beginning, uh, both, uh, you know, the father and the daughter, for very for very different reasons, are kind of taken by this man. For uh, Almer, uh, this man is clearly uh, a, like a you know a means to an end. But for uh, his daughter, uh, there's a romantic interest uh, cooking there. Anyway, uh, it's also interesting how the caste system is mentioned. Uh, there's a there's a Brahmin from Bali who is mentioned on page 44, towards the end of the, the third chapter, uh, sorry, the fourth chapter, uh, he said he was from Bali and a Brahmin, which last statement he made good by refusing all food during his often repeated visits to Lakamba's and Almea's houses. 
So you see how caste untouchability is practiced. So these, you know, interesting details about sociological, anthropological, you know, practices in the community are interesting. Uh, Baba Lachi, who, as I said, will become an important character, and I'll say more about that. But this is an interesting statement he makes, and he's kind of, you know, someone who remains true to it in the latter half of the book as well. He says, I'm only my master's slave. So I'm no one else's slave, is what he's saying. I'm only my master's slave, murmured Baba Lachi in a hesitating manner, right? Uh, it's an interesting moment, you know, because uh, this is something that we see in Conrad quite a bit. The smallest of characters, the tiniest of characters, the most uh, subdued of characters would come out and say something which would stay with you, which would be a very convincing and a memorable statement in a certain sense. Uh, but yeah, more on Babalachi as we follow, as we, as we move on. Chapter 5, uh, again, moving on to... Uh, you know, so there's, yeah, there's another slave girl, there's, there's Bulangi and there's Babalachi, as I said, Bulangi has a slave girl called Tamina, who also seems to like Dane Marula. Of course, Dane Marula and uh, Nina get into this, you know, love relationship, but Tamina is like a third wheel there and, and she's, she's someone who definitely admires Dane Marula and again, she will have a plot role in the latter half of the book. Um, just see if there's something more here. Again, uh, voices in chapter five. Once again, they're mentioned wobbling of soft feminine voices. Uh, the sound, you know, the, to hear the faint rustle of dried grass under the light, under the light footsteps of Nina. Uh, Nina, although averting her face, felt as if this bold-looking being, this bold-looking being, is Dane Marula. This is the beginning of their romance, so to speak. The bold-looking being who spoke burning words into her willing ear was the embodiment of her fate, the creature of her dreams, reckless, ferocious, ready with flashing Chris for his enemies and with passionate embrace for his beloved, the ideal Malay chief of her mother's tradition. So again, what you see quite clearly is that she's not just falling in love with the man, because she identifies with the maternal Malay side of her lineage, this is the man of her dreams. Because in a way, this solidifies her maternal identification, right? So it goes you know, straight into that maternal identification. Her life was complete only when near him and all of the, all these you know, platonic statements come in after that. Um, in his mind's eye, he saw the rich prize in his grasp. So now we see how Dane Marula views uh, Nina. With tin spoon in his hand, he was forgetting the plateful of rice before him in the fanciful arrangement of some splendid banquet to take place on his arrival in Amsterdam and so on. Uh, now, the interesting thing is we don't know at this point, at least, what attracts Dane Marula to uh, Nina. Is it again the prestige of marrying a half-white girl, the prestige of marrying a, you know, a white man's daughter, as it were? Is it that? Again, let's you know, open up that question. We may not have an answer right now. Um, so again, these uh, the references to you know, these little inanimate objects uh, that are again you know, almost helpless as it were. So a great log had stranded there at right angles to the bank, forming a kind of jetty against which the swiftly flowing stream broke with a loud ripple. He stepped on it with a quick but steady motion and in two strides found himself at the outer end with the rush and swirl of the foaming water at his feet. So what we see in these descriptions is, you know, constantly the sense of an artificial structure that is built on the river. The human habitation is almost like this precarious structure that is built on the river and might, you know, fall into it anytime, might collapse into it anytime. That is the sense we get. Um, again, coming back to Nina, reading this little section, her soul lapsing again into the savage mood, this is page 50, uh, which the genius of civilization working by the hand of Mrs. Wink, Mrs. Wink was the teacher, uh, could never destroy, experienced a feeling of pride, 
and of some slight trouble at the high value of her worldly wise mother had put upon her person. But she remembered the expressive glances and words of Dane, and tranquilized, she closed her eyes in a shiver of pleasant anticipation. So, of course, this is the, the, the romance uh, bit. They, they create this sort of exclusive lover's world, as it were, on page 52. Earth, river and sky were wrapped up in a deep sleep from which it seemed there would be no waking. This is very typical, right? The romantic angle, uh, I mean, romance often creates an exclusive world of the two, you know, to put it like Alan Badiou, who talks about two-ness in love, how the lover's world and the encounter of love is a movement from one to two and then to infinity, because the two-ness of love produces an infinite universe in itself. This, you know, ethological angle, this sort of, again, going back to ecology as well as ethology, perhaps, we see this again towards the end of this chapter. There's a beautiful section. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll be quick with this. So, again, we have this idea that there is life and death side by side in this ecology. Apparently, or, or let's say underneath this world of romance, there's a slow, silent working of death. In a moment, the two little nutshells with their occupants floated quietly side by side, reflected by the black water in the dim light, struggling through a high canopy of dense foliage. And it goes on like that. The sleeping water, plants shooting upward. And then at the end, it says... Entwined, interlaced in inextricable confusion, climbing madly and brutally over each other in the terrible silence of a desperate struggle towards the life-giving sunshine above, as if struck with sudden horror at the seeding mass of corruption below, at the death and decay from which they sprang. So again, we see this interdependence of life and death in the ecology. We see how there is a life-giving sunshine above the appearance, which is nice and soothing, and the seething mass of corruption below, right? So the lover's world is not entirely immune from this deep, dark shadow of death from inside, as it were, which is, in a way, a reflection on their precarity and a reflection on their situation. Um, and again, of course, we have all these uh, quite typical romantic dialogues, like, what is life to me without light? Uh, would a man willingly remain long in a dark place? This, you know, idea of love, love and light and darkness. Uh, anyway, uh, Nina leaned over and with a proud and happy smile took Dane's face between her hands. So all these moments of romantic intimacy, gratitude, love. It's called a great tumult of passion. Uh, this is basically the end of this chapter. And let's stop here. So we are at the end of chapter five. Uh, we've more or less covered one thirds of the novel, so that's good. And we will come back to this uh, tomorrow. Uh, any questions so far? No? Okay. Sir? Wonderful. Yeah, sure. You're on mind. Go ahead. Sir, if we look, uh, the, the river plays a very important part in the work. So, uh, if we look at some other uh, works which have the rivers as an important part of the narrative, like George Eliot's Mill on the Floss, for example. Mm -hmm. So, would you agree on the fact that, unlike Eliot, Conrad exoticizes the river in this in this in this text? Yeah, I mean he does because partially because of the cultural setting, right? I mean, Mill on the Floss and some of those texts are much more monocultural, so to speak, right? I mean, they don't really go into an exotic setting. I mean, so it would be interesting to see when Conrad writes, because with Conrad, it's because he's an interstitial subject, it's interesting to see how he describes, let's say, the English landscape, the Polish landscape. And in contradistinction, how would he describe a landscape like this, right? So, uh, yeah, I think the functions, it's interesting that you mentioned Eliot and these, these comparisons could be could be worthwhile. But having said that, I think we need to differentiate between how one we how, how we would uh, depict a river in a completely different setting, in a different country, in a different culture, uh, compared to when I'm describing a river from my own region, let's say, or 
from my own country, which is why I mentioned all those, you know, uh, river novels in Bangla, where there's, you know, a certain kind of monocultural depiction primarily. Even though, of course, you know, with Tarashankar, uh, it's it's a little more complicated. He's also talking about certain caste communities that he doesn't belong to. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I hope that responds to your question. Sir, uh, we when we were doing uh, Chino Achebe back in uh, second, uh, I think, third year last, during our undergraduate degrees, we mm -hmm. read about how Chino Achebe did a contrapuntal reading of Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. So I was wondering if there are any contrapuntal readings of this, this text available. Yeah, so uh, I think the essays that I've uh, shared with you, one of them is definitely interested in that kind of issue of interracial relations and the ideological ambivalence of Conrad that it talks about. Uh, so I think you will get a sense or a flavor of that if you, if you read that, right? One of the essays will have something like that. There's, there's very little on the novel that has been written. We'll talk more about some of the other themes of memory and time as well when we, when we go into the second part of the book. But yeah, there's, there's very little uh, that has been written on the book, uh, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's not that bad a novel, I keep thinking as I keep rereading it. Anyway, yeah. Thank you for that question. Okay, if not anything else, we can stop here. I don't want to delay the next class. You might have another one. I'll just stop the recording and we will come back tomorrow.